thank you very much. Well, thank you, Jordi, and thank you, people, for arranging this. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you for giving up an hour of your time. So what, I, what I'll do now is not probably not a normal research seminar. Uh, it's more a sort of history of what we've been doing at Swansea over the years, uh, split into two parts. Christina will give the latter part. Um, but one of the purposes is also for you to see what kind of work we do and perhaps some for, for me and for us to learn what you are doing. Um, perhaps there's some opportunities for collaboration. I would be delighted if that would be the case. So, yeah, thank you for being here. Um, yeah, I put in the title, or we, we put in the title, to need to see the flames. And this is a bit of a weird um, thing, but you will see during the presentation where this is coming from. So bear with me um, until you realize why we really want to see the flames. We're not pyromaniacs, but <laughs> it's important to see the flames and not, not, many, many, not very many people in our field actually do that. But I'd just like to introduce Swansea University. It's always sunny in Wales. It hardly ever rains. <laughs> this is our campus. It's beautiful. Please come and visit. <laughs> so a little introduction of the first 10 slides or so on fire. Many of you are familiar with fire, but there may be some in the audience who don't know all that much about fire. So I'll just say a few words about wildfires in general. And Wildfires have been around for a long time, essentially since we had flammable vegetation on the land surface. So about 400 million years or so, uh, we've had fire on the land surface. So it's nothing new at all. Currently, about 4.6 million hectares of the global land surface are burning every year. And that's about equivalent of nine times the size of Spain. And it's also equivalent of about 4% yeah, of the Earth's surface. So if you put it into context, within this, the time of a generation of about 30 years, the equivalent of the entire land surface of the globe will be affected by fire. Now, of course, some areas are affected by fire maybe every year or two, savannas. Other areas, perhaps boreal forests, will be only affected by fire every 300 years or so. But generally speaking, fire is pretty much everywhere, except in some areas in Wales where it rains a lot. <laughs> And in fact, you've probably seen in the news, particularly this, this last year, 2017, has been, really, been a really bad year in terms of fires. And of course, we hear about the fires when people die. It's a very sad thing. About the other things, we hear very little in the media. So our view is really biased on where all those fatalities occur. Um, and very often, you will read that fire has gone worse. And fires have gone worse in many areas. But if you look at the global picture, Essentially, remote sensing research has demonstrated that, that over the last few decades, we have a decline in area burnt worldwide by about 20% or so. So we have actually fewer areas burning right now, but these are areas that are now moving from forestry or from savanna grasslands to agriculture, so we don't have any fuel anymore. Those areas are not burning, but there are other areas, for example, Portugal, for example, in California, where we actually see more fires in some places and where there are fires, the fires are worse. So in a sense, fires are getting worse globally, but if we look at the total area, it's actually becoming less due to vegetation change. But as I said, many areas show an increased fire risk, and this is, this is of course what's portrayed in the media, and it's, it's very true. If we look at the climate predictions, and this is not a climate prediction as such, this is simply a prediction of fire weather severity. So weather conditions when fires are particularly bad, and fire, fire or can be particularly bad when they occur, and the fire weather severity, it's a very simple map. You can imagine red is an increase, and this is from several models. It's back from 2013. We will see an increase in fire weather severity in most places around the world. And if we have fuel in those areas, then fire can be expected to be worse. However, fires are not necessarily a bad thing. We have many areas, and many of you are ecologists, you're familiar with this. Many plant species require, or many plant assemblages, require fire for rejuvenation. So for example, the boreal forest here, this is a picture taken out of an aeroplane in uh, northwestern Canada. This is a perfectly normal picture. This maintains ecological diversity. This maintains stand age diversity. Uh, these are lightning ignitions, nothing to do with humans, perfectly normal. Fire recurrence interval in this environment, about every 250 years, you'll get a fire. Perfectly normal. This, the ecosystem has co-involved with fire. If we look at the, dis the distribution of fire around the world, so this is a, um, a 
small map here of the world. The red areas are essentially those areas that are, that are burning. So it's in this case the cumulative burnt area from 96 to 2012. The planet is pretty red. It's very red, for example, in Australia and parts of Africa. These are the savanna areas. So both Africa and Australia are the fire continents. But we don't hear about this in the news. Nobody dies in those savanna fires. They're perfectly normal. They happen perhaps every, every year, every second year, every third year, depending on um, the conditions, the rainfall and the ignitions. Areas of North America, for example, again, we just talked about the boreal forest. Fire is perfectly normal in the boreal forest. We only hear about the fires if they affect human populations. Western United States, many areas, fire adapted, fire is perfectly normal. However, of course, if we go to the Mediterranean or other areas in Europe, it's very complicated because we don't really have the normal vegetation, normal, the vegetation assemblage that we would have had perhaps five, six, seven thousand years ago. We have a highly modified land cover with some plants being adapted to fire, but many plants are not adapted to fire. Many alien species have been introduced, and I'll come back to that later, that have totally changed the fire regime in Europe. So in Europe, the situation is very complex. But fire has a home in Europe, but it's very difficult to actually say how much fire would be natural and beneficial. And when fire is in the news, it's usually bad news. And the bad news, this is what we see. You might remember 2009, the worst fire disaster in Australia. We'll come back to that later on. We've done a little bit of work on this. California last year, and of course Portugal, two very bad fires with the first fire killing 60 people, the highest number of deaths in Portugal in a fire event in recorded history. Here are some figures on the impacts of fire from 1901 to 2017. Yeah, nearly 4,000 people killed. Nothing compared to other disasters in terms of total numbers, but every individual is one too many. Quite a large number of people affected by fire, many houses lost. Total direct costs, 65 billion uh, direct costs of those fires. There are also other aspects that are lesser known. So it's estimated that smoke exposure from wildfire, and that's just wildfire, this is not home cooking or anything else, this is just wildfire. <laughs> Um, that we have about 300,000 premature deaths from smoke exposure per year. And some of you will have, been ex will have been exposed to this. You have fairly frequent fires in some areas of Spain. Some of the smoke that was generated in Spain even came to South Wales last year. So, and other effects, for example this one, you've seen this in the news as well in California. Only a few weeks ago, post-fire debris flows, 21 deaths from mudslides that are a direct, well it's not a direct result, it's an indirect result from fire, but they can be directly linked to fire. And these are, these are the main areas uh, in terms of the impacts that we've been focusing on in our research in the past. But let's just roll back a little bit. What happens during a fire? Of course the vegetation is, some people say destroyed, in some places yes, the forest is being replaced, the trees die. In other cases the trees are charred, but they're perfectly happy to survive the fire. For example, eucalypt forests in Australia, hardly ever does a single tree get killed unless it's an old tree that's already uh, damaged to a degree. So vegetation destruction or renewal. Then you have increased soil erosion, nutrient losses and desertification after fire. And again, that's something I'll be talking about, something that we've been focusing on. You also have the risk of water contamination because you have the ash that's present in the landscape washed into the reservoirs, into the rivers, into the reservoirs. And then finally, of course, you have greenhouse gas emissions. Quite a lot of emissions from fire, about 35 to 40 percent um, in relative terms of the human caused emissions are fire caused. In other words, 100 percent emissions from, from humans, another 35 to 40 percent from wildfires. But these are typically sequestered again during regrowth. But again, Christina will be saying more about this. And these are the three areas that we are working on in Swansea. We are not ecologists, so we don't really uh, work on the vegetation recovery after fire, at least so far. Perhaps we should do some more on this, and perhaps some of the work that we'll be doing with you will, will focus on this. Um, but I'll say a little bit more about these areas that have been focusing on over time. Um, I did my PhD in Portugal, actually, and I'll say a little bit more about that later. So it all started for me with fire here in Portugal in 1994, a long time ago. And then um, 2001 started working in Australia, and then since 2008 we're working also in Canada and United States. And this work is continuing, all these areas we are continuing, and I'd just like to give you a little bit of an insight of 
what we've been doing in these areas and what we've learned and the mistakes we made. So the initial focus has been on soil erosion, hydrology and land degradation. When I came to Swansea, I wanted a PhD, wanted to do a PhD in remote sensing, but I soon realized I wasn't smart enough to work on remote sensing. But I, in my degree, I had focused on soil and weathering and erosion. So I was told by my supervisors, well, we have a project in Portugal, why don't you come along? I said, well, I'm coming to Wales, why should I go to Portugal? OK, right, let's go to Portugal. <laughs> so I went, went with them to Portugal and they gave me a specific task. This is what the si situation looked like at the time and it hasn't changed very much so you don't actually see a lot of natural vegetation here in Portugal small land ownership a lot of afforestation rural depopulation planting of eucalypts and planting of pines eucalyptus globulus and penis pinaster now of course during that time fire was already high on the agenda and of course it's still on the agenda particularly in the northern part of Portugal so in this period 1990 to 2005 um, we had about 2.3 million hectares burned, which is 25% of the country and not the whole country is forested. It's basically pretty much all of this is in the north. So I started my PhD pretty much in the middle of this period and one of the issues there was post-fire erosion. And given that I had a background in soil, my task was to look into this a little bit more. There were concerns about erosion and also about nutrient losses. My specific focus was on something called soil water repellency, and perhaps nobody of you has, has heard about this, so I'll introduce this a little bit more. What is soil water repellency? It's the, basically soil that doesn't really wet properly. In other words, this is a very sandy soil. It's a nice pretty picture done in the lab. This is what you expect from a soil. You put water on a soil, it goes in. Now you all know it's not necessarily the case. If you have a succulent plant at home, a cactus or something, and you let it dry for a little while and you put this the you you water the plant it will not necessarily go in it'll maybe go through the pot and come out at the bottom and you make a mess and you have to wipe it up <laughs> this is water repellency basically and it's surprisingly common this is almost the same soil slightly different organic compounds in this soil but the, the content of organic matter in this soil is probably around one percent and a small fraction of this 1% are hydrophobic compounds and those compounds on those sand grains are sufficient to stop infiltration completely. And that has a number of implications, one of which is enhanced runoff and enhanced erosion. Now there was something in the literature from the United States that my supervisors were very familiar with and this is essentially before the fire you have your normal soil so it's perfectly wettable. Then you have a fire if the temperature is less than 300 degrees in the soil surface, maybe 250, 180 or something, the soil will then become water repellent. That's called fire-induced water repellency, and everybody cited that work. It was done in Chaparral in California. Many measurements went into this. If the temperature exceeded 300 degrees, and again, this, this 300 degrees is an important figure. Christina will come back to that later. The very surface of the soil the water repellency essentially cooked off or the compounds are basically degraded and combusted and the soil at the very surface will be wettable but underneath it will be highly water repellent. And that is actually one of the factors coming back to the landslides or the mudslides in California. This is one of the big problems uh, that has contributed to those landslides in California with 21 people dead. So it's a big issue. No big landslides in Portugal but at least in Portugal they wanted to know you know, how much hydrophobicity is there, how, how severe is it after the fire. Okay, well, I should have gone back a little bit. So my task was to find out about the water repellency and the, the, the idea was that in my thesis that I would investigate the causes for any spatial and temporal variability. Okay, that was the idea. Now, when I, when I sampled lots and lots of soils, brought lots of samples back to the lab, I found everything was water repellent, everything before the fire, after the fire, at the surface, at depth, there was no, I had graphs, there was just the same number everywhere. So I thought my PhD will be a complete disaster because <laughs> I have nothing to investigate other than saying it's a lot more than we thought. <laughs> and this model, and let's just go back briefly, this model did not apply. The soils were, after planting eucalypts and pine, were extremely hydrophobic. And still today, I've done lots of hydrophobicity measurements in my life and Portugal is one of the most hydrophobic places in the world. Okay, 
So, yes, that's where I was. I thought I will fail my PhD. And in my Viva, the examiner said, I'm very glad that you don't try and display hundreds of graphs with the same figure. You came to the point very quickly saying, there is not much difference, I'll need to do something else. So I did more experiments, um, not just about the spatial variability that wasn't there. But basically, one of the things that we found, and this comes back to the overall theme of the presentation, we went there after the fires. We didn't know how the fires were burning. We didn't actually know until I looked at some unburned sites whether the soil was wettable before the fire. So basically my supervisors have given me the wrong idea that it's fire and use hydrophobicity. It wasn't. There was hydrophobicity irrespective of the fire. But we didn't really see how the fire was burning. So we didn't really see what effect it had on the soil. But anyway, that, that sort of came later. What we also did do, we did lots of rainfall simulations. Some of you may be familiar with this. You bring your own rainfall, you apply it in the field. And yes, you can probably see here, the water is, the soil is not soaking up the water properly, but it didn't really matter because there were enough pathways from roots, from bioturbation, from also desiccation cracks in the summer that the water will go into the soil and there won't be a problem. There's only a problem when there is a fire and the fire removes all the vegetation and seals off the cracks and then you do actually get a problem. So hydrophobicity in Portugal is a problem but it's not that it's not there before the fire, it's just the fire makes the ground much more susceptible to hydrophobicity generating uh, runoff. But the much bigger problem in Portugal is actually something that I didn't do in my PhD but the overall research in Portugal from Swansea has pretty much demonstrated with lots of measurements that what they do after the fire in terms of rehabilitating the land and planting is far worse than the hydrophobicity and any of the erosion after the fire. Because here everything is being removed after the fire. The ground is churned up with these super plows basically and the soil loss is here on this rehabilitated land so to speak during the rehabilitation are much greater than anything after the fire. So that's really the big problem in this environment rather than the fire itself. So one of the lessons was that the planting practices, and they still are, they have improved over time, but they still are much more damaging in terms of soil losses and also in terms of nutrient losses than the fire itself. Okay, other lessons. In 2001 there were big wildfires in Sydney, quite extreme, a little bit out of season. I was a postdoc at the time on half a salary and a colleague of mine he was also a postdoc. A colleague, he was very good in sediment tracing. I was supposed to be an expert on eucalypts and water repellency, supposedly. I've never seen a real eucalypt tree, I've just seen these little trees. So we wrote a proposal in investigating um, soil erosion near Sydney and near the Sydney main water supply. And we got funding. It was really good. Although, unfortunately, we put my supervisor, for good reason obviously, was on the proposal because we were not able to submit as postdocs. And then the funding body came back to us, oh, I have the same expertise as my supervisor, kick me out. So my supervisor and the postdoc, the others were supposed to do the work. But they, we had an agreement, so we shared the salary in the end. But anyway, that's <laughs> on the side. But anyway, we, as experts on water repellency and fires and sediment tracing, we went to, um, to Sydney. The water supply managers of Sydney, um, they worked with us, they invited us to work in their catchment. And basically we had five years of research funding, partly from, from the UK, partly from Sydney Catchment Authority, um, to investigate all aspects of soil erosion in this environment. It's been a great time. Um, but in this environment, the soils were also naturally highly water repellent. But in this environment, it, the story was a little bit different. The soils became hot enough during the fire so that the first one or two centimeters became wettable. And that made quite a difference in terms of erosion dynamics. But our assumption initially was, wow, a lot of rainfall after the fire, extreme fire, loose sandy soils, there's got to be a lot of erosion. Whew. But what we didn't know is there were some parameters that made this environment not very susceptible to erosion. And I'm just going to focus on these guys here, ants, something just we hadn't, we hadn't really anticipated at all. There's these funnel ants, they're quite big, they're really nasty, so they're actually, they're really aggressive. They sort of pop out of, of their little, little nest here 
and they will actually attack you, not in masses, but I have sat on some and it's, it's, it's very painful. But anyway, that's besides the point. The soil is very hydrophobic, but what you will see after the fire, they become very, very active and they generate all these holes and they have big nests. So the soil there can take up almost any amount of rainfall. I mean, there is a limit at some point, but in terms of the erosion caused by, by rainfall, it's relatively little and it's something we were soil scientists, we didn't have a clue. We basically found this out by months of monitoring, uh, looking at erosion, measuring erosion, measuring runoff. Um, but it turns out the bioturbation, and these are not the only important uh, animals there. They're birds who are scraping up the, the ground. Um, that was one of the key parameters there. So in that sense, the terrain there is not very susceptible to erosion. And you could also say, if you're a bit hippie, you would say that the environment looks after itself. Okay. So everything works together. The plants make the soil hydrophobic, but it doesn't matter because the, the animals make the water infiltrate. Okay. So. One of the things we've learned is the soils were naturally highly water repellent, a little more so after the fire. The vegetation recovery is incredible. It's absolutely incredible. Some of you may be familiar with this. This here is called epicormic growth. This is immediately after the fire, after a few days, the trees are capable of bringing out those shoots directly from the bark and almost every single tree survives. You go to this landscape, everything is black and this is only a few months after the fire. This almost looks, looks like a normal forest. So that was really interesting to us. Now in this environment, the ultimate upshot of five years of work is that fire is important. It is a risk for water quality, and again, I'll come back to that later. But its impacts, it's normal. Every 30 years, you burn the forest naturally through lightning. It's just part of the landscape dynamic. It's nothing unusual. Oh yeah, and we learned how to surf. So that was quite <laughs> useful too. A little bit. But there was another interesting effect and that's just by chance, one of these chance observations in the field. When we got there at the very first day we had a key from the Sydney water supply catchment went into the catchment and the farmer who, who owns the land around it said, what are you doing here? And we said oh we investigate the fire. And he said, You're too bloody late. So yes we were late but in fact he, he didn't even know how right he was because one of the things we weren't able to see because until we got funding it took a few months, is what happened immediately after the fire. And one of the years we were, when we were investigating the area, there was a new fire in the area. So we thought, ah, we can, we can do some measurements of erosion immediately from day one after fire. So we installed some erosion measurements. And what we didn't realize is the role of ash, how important the ash is. This is what it looks like essentially a day or two after a fire. We went away, went back to our camp. There was a big rainfall event overnight, 30 millimeters overnight. In the campground, there was a complete mess. The paths were totally eroded and everything. So, wow, we're going to go back to this place and it's going to be amazing. We have all these new measurements of extreme erosion. Nothing. The next day, there was nothing. And the reason there was nothing is there is this layer of ash, which is highly absorbent and it takes up a lot of rainfall. It's like a sponge. So it can protect the environment, and again you could say as a hippie kind of thing, oh yeah, the environment looks after itself. But this can erode if the rainfall exceeds the capacity of the ash. But in this case it didn't. But what it meant was for us, look, we really have to go to burned areas immediately after, or even better, see the fire itself, see what, how much, what happens, see how much vegetation is being removed and turned to ashes. So yeah, it took me a while to really realize how important that is, but that brings me on to what Christina is going to say very shortly. But just one more example. Because we were now established specialists on eucalypts and wildfire, we got more funding from the UK to work on the Black Saturday fires that I mentioned earlier. Worst disaster in Australian history, 173 deaths, 450,000 hectares burned in two days. So very, very rapid. And I'm not gonna go into too much detail about why this happened that's another story and for those of you who come for dinner we could perhaps talk about this. But a few things to say is in this area we had the highest regional temperatures ever recorded and Melbourne isn't as hot as, as uh, Sydney for example so the Melbourne region doesn't really get that hot. Extreme fuel loads. In this environment we have two to three times as much flammable litter uh, and vegetation compared to the Sydney area where we worked on before. Very strong winds up to 115 kilometers per hour. 
And that led to an extreme fire intensity. I'm not sure how familiar you are with the concept of fire intensity. It's the energy that's being generated by a flaming front. 80,000 kilowatts per meter is a lot. Let's put it that way. The, the limit for uh, firefighters to really deal with a fire effectively is about 2,000. Right? Okay, so anything above 2,000, just forget it. Just forget it, basically. So this was extreme. And so we thought, wow, this has been the ex most extreme event in Australian history. Give us some money, we do some research there. Gave us some money, did some research there. So yeah, the assumption was we're going to find an extreme impact on the soil. So again, we wanted to look at what happened to water repellency. So we knew that it should get quite extreme, and in the surface, it should be destroyed. That's what we anticipated, because it was such an extreme fire. This is what the landscape looks like after the fire. And for those of you who are interested in ecology, nearly every single tree here survived. Right? It, you, d you wouldn't think so, but they do. But one of the things we looked at was, was water repellency, so the changes in, in the wet ability on the ground. But also we teamed up with, um, uh, with uh, colleagues from Melbourne, Tina Bell, and they were looking at seed germination because in such an extreme fire you would have thought that the seeds in the ground would also be destroyed because it was so hot. And so the lesson we've learned is no, we were wrong. The impacts on the soil were quite modest. So this is what it looks like very soon. It's a couple of weeks after the fire already. And what we found is that the seed germination was very good. What we also found is that the soil water repellency was actually not destroyed. Perhaps in the first one or two centimeters but not to any great depth. And the soil was pretty much intact, right? So we figured that the temperature was perhaps below 200 degrees because we have all the seed surviving and the water pouncy hadn't been, hadn't been destroyed except the very top. Now, why is that? We, again, we were completely wrong with our assumptions. And everybody else would have had the same assumption, to be fair. We were not the only ones. So why was this? The key was the fire behavior. And again, it's something we didn't know. It's been described, but there were no measurements, no direct measurements. Now, what we had, of course, were the extreme fuel dryness. So very flammable, very, very high winds. So it generates, it does generate a lot of energy. But the residence time was very short. In other words, I don't have a lighter here, but I do that with students. You, 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 you light, light your lighter. And you can move your hand over it, no problem. But if you slow down, you, oh, ouch, right? <laughs> so if you move very fast, there's little opportunity for energy input into the soil. Even if the energy is very, very high, if it's very fast, it's very little. And this is essentially what had happened in this fire. So there was a limited opportunity for energy transfer. At least that's our conclusion from this. But we don't necessarily, oops, we don't necessarily know exactly what had happened because we have no measurements from the fire. We just have some indicators. So, and I shall wrap up very soon so Christina can, can, uh, can talk. So the assumption was, well, certainly the finding was limited soil heating, but what we did find is lots of ash was covering the landscape. And this had implications for water quality, for example, but also for something that we then began to think about. And this is essentially the landscape carbon dynamics. We have all that carbon stored in the litter and the vegetation, and some of this is converted to charcoal and lies on the ground. So from this study, where we were looking at soil impacts, we then published something completely different that we hadn't actually worked on, and that is the carbon dynamics um, of the fire. But again, these findings are largely indirect evidence. Okay? You can see that's a snake. It's not alive, but anyway. It's my colleague Rick Shakespeare. I've done a lot of field work with him. Unfortunately, he's retired now. But it's, yeah, it's been good fun working with him. <laughs> but what we didn't know is how exactly was the soil heated? How long did the fire last on a, on a particular point? We weren't really sure how much of the ash was from the vegetation and how much from the ash was the, the burned soil that was disintegrated. We didn't know how much vegetation was turned to ashes. So again, we really need to see the flames. And that then leaves me with Christina, who's going to the next part of the presentation. Which side? This side? Yeah, it should work. No. No. It's yeah, the other. Yeah, no, but this side, these.
No. Yeah, do this. It's fine. Yeah, but this. That'll work. Play that. Okay, and this goes here. Right. Thank you, Stefan. First of all, of course, thank you, Jordian people, for organizing this, and you all for coming here. I'm not as entertaining as <laughs> Stefan, but I will, and my English is not his English, but I will try my best. So yeah, chasing fires. It sounds exciting. It's really exciting. It's amazing for photography. So if you <laughs> like taking pictures, you can do something like this. That's Stefan. He even made made it to one of the journal's uh, uh, covers, so all is great, but it's a lot of work. It's a lot of <laughs> dirty, dirty work. It's not, we are not miners, we are just very dirty from after post-fire uh, sampling. And it's also a very risky research. I mean, chasing real wildfires, and we have done it a couple of times, is risky because you are going into a wildfire. Uh, we decided we are not doing that anymore, at least by the time being. But anyway, going to a prescribed fire or to an experimental fire is risky in the way that there is a huge uncertainty. It may burn, you may have the wrong weather conditions, you may have problems with that owners. Well, there are many different factors. And the problem is you go to Canada, Australia for a whole month. If the fire doesn't happen, you have no data. It's not like other field work that you may get good data or not such good data, but fire investigation is tricky. So after five years chasing fires, we have learned why not more people do this, but still we, we like it anyway. <coughs> so I actually met Stefan here in Barcelona in a conference 10 years ago and we were talking and then after I finished my PhD, nothing to do with fires actually pretty boring PhD about carbon characterization in salt marsh environments. I decided I wanted to move into something that I really like. I'm, I'm from like people, northwest of Spain. We have big problems with fire, so it's, it's a topic that I have been really passionate about since I was a kid. Anyway, I talked with Stefan, I moved to Swansea with a postdoc. Um, we were discussing the possibility of looking into like instrumenting a real experimental fire and then finally Stefan had been in in conversations with the Canadians for a few years and he man finally managed an invitation to participate in the Canadian Boreal Community Fire Smart project. So this is basically in the middle of nowhere so you have to drive 2,000 kilometers from Calgary up here full of mosses, full of mosquitoes June, but they burn that. So they have, I don't know if you can see here, that's the, that's the boreal forest. They have plots set aside for experimental fires and what they do, they replicate, they try to simulate wildfire conditions. This project started in the middle 90s uh, to to improve the modeling of fire behavior under extreme fire conditions. So that's a picture from 2004. Anyway, so we were um, invited to join the project, very excited. Not a lot of money, but we managed with what we had. And the idea of my fellow, uh, uh, fellowship for my postdoc uh, state in Swansea was to look into carbon mo mobilization after fire. That made sense because Stefan, as, as, as he explained, he was an expert in, carbo uh, sorry, in soil erosion. My PhD was about carbon characterization, so this might say, right? But the Canadian Boreal Forest um, co um, Community Experiment had a problem that was completely flat. Mm -hmm. So there was <laughs> it wasn't a good place to look into fire uh, uh, soil erosion. But anyway, as I had said, we it was such a good opportunity. We really wanted to go there. So we decided, okay, doesn't matter, my PhD was about soils, he was an expert in soils, let's, let's study the effect of fire in soils. But, another problem there. Uh, the water table in that area is very high and they have what they call organic soils, forest floor, 
quite thick. This is organic, I don't know if you can see, but anyway, this is the state of the um, soil after a very intense fire. I will show a, um, a video later, but basically it doesn't burn into the soil because it's very wet. So anyway, the mineral soil is deep down there and doesn't even know that the fire has gone through. So our second idea, not possible either. <laughs> But then, uh, I had started uh, to read about fires, our carbon, and what we call pyrogenic carbon. I don't know if anyone here works with biochar? No? Anyway, but have you heard about biochar? Okay, good. So, <clears throat> so we were into this topic and then we realized there were some gaps in the topic. So I, I go back to that in a minute. But, so basically, uh, when you have a fire, you have the carbon in the biomass that burns. Part of it, as Stefan explained, goes to the atmosphere, but part of it, as Stefan explained, uh, remains in on the ground as charcoal or as ash. So, uh, the so from that carbon that is burned, not all, not all is emitted. So a fraction is staying on the ground, but the, that something else. The fire transforms this carbon chemically, so it's really resistant to degradation. And I don't know if you are uh, familiar with paleo environmental studies, but many of them they use charcoal layers to to um, to look into past uh, climates and past environments because charcoal can be stored in soils and sediments for thousands and years. Uh, and thousands of years. So if you look at the resident time of charcoal, and well, it's not completely like that, but let's assume, like generally speaking, so it's much more recalcitrant or mu much more resistant to degradation than the unburned biomass. So it's what we can call a carbon sink, but we can discuss that if, if you want later. Anyway, so if this is true, why Pyrogenic carbon is not included in carbon emission modeling and car carbon budget modeling dealing with fire effect in ecosystems. To start with, we don't know how much is produced in the first place. So, previous figures, before we started working with this, they were around less than 5% of the carbon. So they said, well, basically what is remaining on the ground, not emitted, is less than 5% of the carbon that burns. So why we are going to bother to even look into that? But then we are starting to read the papers and we realized that all of them had one of these, at least one of these two limitations. First, only one, uh, so, sorry, only a part of the pyrogenic carbon continuum was quantified. And by continuum I mean charcoal can be the charcoal we all have in mind, like goody pieces of charcoal, but it can be like tiny, tiny particles, for example, in the ash layer. Uh, so people, soil people sample their soils, uh, people who work with trees look into the trees, but nobody look into the different components after the fire, and I will give an example later. Also, different chemical techniques have different, like quantify different windows of this pyrogenic carbon, because pyrogenic carbon is not a chemically defined compound, it's just any a organic compound that has been transformed due to fire. So it's not like you can detect it in a GCMS spectra by one peak or so. Anyway, the other limitation was that most studies were not representative of wildfires. So they use lab experiment or small scale experiments or they went to a fire, as Stefan had done with, with his previous research, after the fire, but you don't know the pre-fire situation. You look for a control area that is similar, but you are never sure how, how similar really is. Anyway, so if you want to do a um, detailed and um, full quantification of the pyrogenic carbon produced, you need to be there before the fire, so you can quantify the carbon in the different uh, uh, fuel components, we call them fuel components, like understory, overstory, forest floor, mineral soil, so on. You need to be there, well not there, there, but nearby, <laughs> during the fire, 
So you can monitor, you can place your thermologers and you can see how hot does it get and for how long. And as Stefan explained too, you need to be there immediately after the fire because some of these ash is very uh, mobile, both by um, a water erosion but also by wine, uh, sorry, wind erosion. So you need all that. And then we thought, okay, now we have a great excuse to go to Canada. So that's what we did because this is the perfect, perfect setting. And of course, our fire was going to be representative, representative of wildfire conditions. So we were there, we had uh, help from some great Canadian colleagues. We did, I'm not going into details, but we w did a very detailed uh, fuel um, quantification before the fire. We set our loggers. So I don't know if you are familiar, but it's basically sensors that are cables. So you place the sensors whenever you, wherever you want, and you bury your loggers deep to make sure they don't get burned. We had a fire. This is one of the examples. And as you can see, it's quite similar to a wildfire. So this was black spruce. We have work in black spruce and also in jack pine there, which are the two main species in the boreal forest in, in North America. And something that I didn't say before, this project is also very interesting because the fires, experimental fires happen every year. So you are uh, able to, to have a replicate of fires. So, anyway, it's very impressive. One of the most impressive things about fires is the sound, but anyway, an another time. So, we were immediately after the smoke cleared, we went there with mossy nets, loads of mosquitoes, as I, I said, and we did all the quantification of all the different fuels, components. In this case, there was no understory, and the mineral soil, as I said before, doesn't even know that there was a fire, so those are not included. But very, very roughly, um, we quantify the fuel components before the fire. These are the tons of carbon in each fuel component, down wood, so the dead, dead woody debris. Uh, over story is important. This is only the fuel that is available to burn. So the standing timber, the proper tree, we don't account for that because that doesn't burn. So it's, this is basically the canopy needle, small twins um, and the bark. But anyway, so this was before the fire and that's what we found after the fire. So because we measure again what was not burned, what was converted into pyrogenic carbon and then you just subtract and you know how much was emitted. And actually if you put all this together, we found out that almost 28% of the carbon was not emitted, but was actually staying there as pyrogenic carbon. So this is what we think, it was a quite an important uh, finding in, in our field. And also in this paper, we did a, re, a thorough re, a review of the previous study and show why none of them were complete. So anyway, but the problem is, this is only one fire, so we are very happy with it, but then at the same time is, oh my God, we are saying 28%, now everyone is using that figure everywhere. Is this really representative? So we knew it was representative of those, uh, of the boreal conditions, but we need, we, we need more fires and other ecosystems. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we have been doing since 2012, more in the boreal forest. Um, we have been there five more times, five, yeah, five more times. The first year everything worked out perfectly. We thought, oh, this is the way. The, se the next two years we were there for a, a whole month, nothing happened. Because sometimes the weather was too re rainy, other times it was too hot, so then the risk is high and you, they don't allow you to burn. So anyway, but we have been in the boreal forest, we have been also many times in Australia. We are doing now some work in the UK, although we haven't, so we haven't, able, we haven't been able to monitor any fire because this has been so rainy for the last two years. But anyway, we'll manage at some point. And this is, I'm quite proud of this. This is the first high intensity 
big experimental fire in Spain. This was in Asturias in, in October this year. So uh, our three main focus is pyogenic carbon, as I said, ash and soil. And I'm going to give you just a brief Oof, sorry, <laughs> we are running late. Anyway, just very briefly, a few examples of what we do. So, pyrogenic carbon. We also wrote a review uh, identifying many, many gaps. So, when, when, when the reviewers, one of the reviewers, uh, look at this figure, and that person didn't like the, 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 red, the red question marks. And Personally, I think it's the best part of the figure because you know where you need to focus. But anyway, <laughs> we are still here in pyrogenic carbon production. There are so many things to know that we haven't even moved uh, any further. But so an example of pyrogenic carbon production that we have been done uh, doing, sorry, uh, I, I include this because I thought it may be someone uh, from the biochar community, but anyway. Um, biochar, as you know, is a way of sequestering carbon from the atmosphere and improving soil fertility. So it's very trendy. Every week there are thousands of, not thousands, but <laughs> many, many papers about biochar. Uh, and biochar, we always consider is very similar to wildfire charcoal. But there have been no real like, studies comparing the two under the same circumstances because Obviously, people don't know what is the temperature and duration that the wildfire charcoal has been formed in. So what we did, we took material that was burned do, uh, during the fire and was transformed into charcoal. We knew the temperature and duration and we did the same in, with the biochar, right? And then we look into, well, we did a detailed characterization, chemical characterization, uh, just to look at the carbon sequestration potential. Let's forget all these figures, but basically, even if you have the, f the same feedstock, the biochar pyrolysis and the wildfire charcoal production mechanisms are very different. So <coughs> a charcoal that is produced from the same material, that is produced at much higher temperatures, the carbon sequestration potential is much lower than the biochar. And I'm not going to go into details about this. I'm happy to discuss if anyone is interested. But again, this has imp important implications because we cannot compare and we cannot use the biochar findings for the wildfire charcoal and so on, at least not uh, many of them. Anyway, then we uh, have been also focusing on ash. Uh, basically, we have realized we can characterize ash very detailed, but we need to go into the the landscape, uh, sorry, landscape scale if we want to do something applied. So we developed with some collaborators in Australia. We were able to develop a um, remote sensing index that tells you how much ash is produced, and then because we are there and we have sampled the ash, we know how much nutrients. Uh, how, how, how much the quantity of nutrients and type of nu nutrients that are in the ash. And this can be the basis to develop, look, for example, post-fire as erosion models into the waters. So, okay, I'm not going to explain that, but basically this information is very useful to tell uh, water managers, okay, so you may expect, for example, to, in one of your reservoirs, the biggest amount of phosphorus, for example, you can have a, after a fire is whatever, this, I don't know, half a ton or, or something. And also in what type of, of chemical form. Uh, this is just a worst case uh, scenario, what we did in our first uh, part of uh, the research, what is not good enough. So now we are working with a lot of people from Australia, uh, from the States and from Portugal. Some of them are engineers, others are water chemists, and we are looking into develop a proper model that can predict and can really help the end users. And the last part, is anyone here working with soil? Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> 
So yeah, our third line is fire effect on soils. And just a very brief but quite important message. When we started investigating this these fires, um, prescribed, experimental, chasing some real wildfires, and we put the sensors in the soils, we realized that uh, the normal approach may not be very suitable. And let me explain. What we, when we talk about fire effect on soils, we always talk about, as Stefan did, about temperature. So. This is just a diagram, I'm not going into it, but basically these are some biological properties, soil properties, some chemical properties and some physical properties of the soil, and you can see how they are affected at the different temperatures. And it's usually, we usually use the 300 degrees threshold for many, many parameters. So we say, okay, if it's more than 300, it's affected, and so on. But we have realized, and makes sense, but anyway, <laughs> that temperature is not only the, the only important factor. Because after having, and I can tell you, this is only one example, but most of the fires, but the smoldering, smoldering fires, most of the fires look the same. The input of heat into the soil is very high, so you can have 800, we have recorded up to 1,000 degrees on the forest floor surface, it's very high, but it's very quick, very quick. So uh, the fire usually goes very quick unless it's an, a smoldering fire, like for example in peatlands, or at least it's burning, you have a big log and it's burning, and of course the soil under the log is cooked. But otherwise, what we are finding, and we are writing a review with other people who have also data from real uh, fires and prescribed fires, is that generally speaking, the temperature be above that threshold that we have been talking about, the 300 degrees, is most of the times less than five minutes. I think we found one case. Was it one case? Anyway, most of the times it's less than five minutes. Mm -hmm. So that has very important implications from, for example, for lab experiments, because what people tend to do is just cook soils. They, they get the soil, they put it in the furnace <laughs> for two hours at 500 degrees. So then the message we are trying to send and we are trying to do it in our lab too is we need to simulate the real conditions if we want to see the real effect. So, well, that's basically it. Uh, what's next? Uh, we are working now into incorporating this pyrogenic carbon production in global emission models. Uh, also, well, optimizing prescribed fires guidelines for water pollution and carbon emissions. Uh, this end user model I talk about, about uh, water contamination risk after fires. We are now, we He's a geographer, I'm a biologist, but we have realized social perceptions and the social aspect of things is so important. We are now also working in, in that. And last but not least, we are very excited that we are <laughs> starting some mm, work with about um, affecting biodiversity and ecosystem services. And of course, we are we would be very happy to have any news, ideas or potential collaboration with any of you. So that's all. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry if we were a bit late. <laughs> Stefan, yeah. No, 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 you can. <laughs> we're almost reaching fire from temperature. Yes, <laughs> yes. I don't know if it's maybe it's the. Is yeah, I saw. Oh, you <laughs> 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 Death <Yeah>. by slides. <laughs> <laughs> so I wonder uh, the temperature that uh, the wildfire reach, uh, in which, uh, so yeah, the temperatures that are reached during the wildfire determines about the amount of. Uh, carbon that is 
that? Well, it's temperature and also it's resident time, like because sometimes you have like a very quick pass of the flames. Uh, it depends on the type of soil, it depends on the type of fuel, but um, we have some papers about, um, for example, uh, we have seen a relationship in the field between temperature and resident time and the amount of carbon that is, yeah, that is remaining. It's basically, you have more carbon emitted, but the carbon that remains is more recalcitrant, is more resistant to degradation. So it's interesting, that's why we are interested in including this in models, to see. But did you have a way to simulate uh, wildfire intensity in some way? Or in the lab? In the first sky fires that you tested? Ah, in, this, in some of them, yeah, yes. No, in no. some of them, we just, like for example, in Australia, they have big prescribed fires, so they are very nice and they make the fire a bit more intense for us in a specific area. So, yeah, without telling their boss, <laughs> but yeah. This is a question for uh, but Of course, this is, is very, very vegetation specific, and, and we're always talking in the eucalyptus or Mediterranean or uh, conifer. Uh, but when you move to the tropical forest, then, then not, nothing of this works because a very, very, very slight fire uh, and very low temperature, no flames practically will everything yeah mm -hmm. and actually nothing burns there's no wood burning in, in the tropics said. well it's it's still the fine fuels that are burning or mm. if you think of the Indonesian fires of course they're burning into peat deposits this is where the main fuel is and this is I guess one of the biggest problems in in tropical fires at the moment where we're losing huge carbon stocks in the ground uh, but also the tropical forests it's you know it's, it's well known that fires are not necessarily occurring very often perhaps every 500,000 years naturally and the fires that do occur, they change the tropical rainforest dynamic completely. They make the, 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 the forests more susceptible to subsequent fires. So it's a completely different dynamic to anything, mm. as you say, anything we've, we've discussed so far. But it's a real problem. I'm particularly Southeast Asia, every few years, Southeast Asia in the news is in the news. And those huge carbon stocks in, in, the, in the tropical areas that are now being drained for palm oil plantations and other, you know, other agricultural uses or silvicultural uses, yeah, they are being irreversibly destroyed mm. due to fire. It's it's a very sad story. Yeah. That's what I when I said smoldering fires. That what I that's what I meant. Uh, smoldering is without no flaming fires, but just very very long resident times. And mm. that's what I'm not sure. I think they, they on the contrary they pass very fast because the amount of fuel. I mean, it's it, just it, heat it depends on which specific tropical environment you you. I mean, I guess you have your your tropical lowland forests that are developed on, on peaty soils and they're a very unique uh, tropical ecosystem and they only burn if they're drained. Mm. Otherwise you have a, you know, have little surface virus that have not, done nothing and the other tropical forests that are on say relatively poor, also organic poor soils, um, as you say, there isn't actually all that much fuel, particularly on the ground and the fuel that's available for burning, it's very very quick. Mm. But unfortunately even with that quick burning conditions, the, the trees are not adapted to fire so the cambium is, is very very thin um, they might die in the fire or they might die a few years later because they weaken but then the whole forest ecosystem is being changed and then the regrowth you get a lot of fine fuel regrowth you get rapid regrowth but not of big tropical rainforest trees but a lot of shrubby material fine fuels that dries out very quickly and then you have that sad uh, recurring cycle of tropical fires and you don't get your rainforest back so it's from that perspective also from a carbon stock perspective in the biomass it's a real problem and yeah. it's pretty much detached from anything that we've done here because we are dealing with ecosystems that we've been focusing so far that are fairly well fire adapted uh, and that normally recover quite well yeah we need to go to the tropics that's right, and yes. do some research <laughs> that's a good excuse to work <laughs> in the tropics thank you so do, do we know why this soil is in uh, Australia or Portugal is so hydrophobic? So, so soils are yeah. so hydrophobic. Well, I, I guess I spent a good time of my career working on water repellency, although my first advice <laughs> from a, a co-supervisor was you have to look at something else. <laughs> you know, you've got to do something else. Well, what should I doing now? But anyway, it's been uh, a lot of work on the chemistry of water repellency. And basically what you have is you have a mixture between um, non-polar compounds, alkanes, and some amphiphilic compounds, so, so compounds that have a hydrophobic chain and then have a polar end on them, 
and in combination, they can be very powerful in making soils hydrophobic. These compounds are present in almost any soil, but they need to be arranged in a particular way um, to make the soils hydrophobic. So if you have a soil grain and those polar compounds, they're like a soap, for example, they can align with the hydrophobic tails pointing outwards into the pore space and then the soils become very hydrophobic. And that's surprisingly common. In the UK, lots of rainfall, you know, place, um, a lot of the soils, when they dry, are actually very hydrophobic. So with the sand dunes that we have in Swansea, for example, low organic matter content, um, sometimes when you dig a hole in the winter, some of that soil will not become wet. But it doesn't matter, because the water will find its way into the groundwater somewhere, there's plenty of vegetation on the surface. So it's not an unusual phenomenon, but the phenomenon makes itself um, known in a way in a post-fire erosion environment, or for example, I spent years working on golf courses, I hate golf, but you know, that's where the research money was. Golf courses, for example, have a huge problem with hydrophobicity because they're like a fungal zoo, they generate a lot of hydrophobic compounds, and then when it becomes dry, you get these brown patches mm. because even with, the, with the, a lot of irrigation, the water is not going in anymore, and then the wetting agent companies, they make a lot of money by applying chemicals to actually make this fungal zoo wettable again. So it's, it's a common problem, but it doesn't manifest itself as a serious problem unless you have some specific conditions. But uh, the, or the origin of the hydrophobic material Ah, uh, uh, no, sorry, yes. Sorry, my, my, yeah, my, my answer was going the wrong direction. In, in the eucalypt environment, the uh, eucalypt leaves, they're quite oil rich. So some of those hydrocarbons are basically the, the oils that are derived from eucalypt leaves. But probably more important are some microbial compounds that can be super hydrophobic. I mean, they can be extremely hydrophobic, particularly some fungal compounds, but there are also some microbes, other microbes that generate this material. But we spent maybe five, six years trying to correlate the specific uh, chemistry in the soil and also in terms of the origin where the material is coming from with the severity of water repellency, and it just, it just didn't work. It appears that it's a very, very small fraction of very specific organic matter that can be from microbes, that can be from organic matter that's basically condensating during the fire. It can be from leaching from the litter. It can be abraded from, from, uh, from grass, swords, so waxes on the surface are abraded and end up in the soil. All of these compounds have the capability of causing water repellency. Just to give you an example, if you clear a eucalypt forest for agriculture and 30 years of perhaps grass growth or, or other agricultural uses in the soil is still very hydrophobic from this residue compounds from perhaps millennia of eucalypt growth that have accumulated in the soil and they're very powerful and reduce uh, the, the wettability. You cannot tell how old it is. How old? Yes. Um, yeah, I actually don't know. I have never occurred to me that would be an interesting area for, yeah. for investigation. I suppose that um, if if the percentage of, of carbon that you that stays as pyrogenic compound very recalcitrant is high enough, you could have the situation which is not very intuitive that the fire would be good. In, I mean, the net effect of the fire would be removing carbon from the atmosphere, and um, which I, I understand this is what the direction you are getting into at the moment. But I suppose that that percentage is extremely variable depending on the type of vegetation, the condition, that probably should read your review anyway. No, but, uh, this is why we're here to give the seminar. I, I, I would like to know what else you can, what can you add on the, I mean, do you already, do we or you already know what type of systems are more prone to have higher percentages of these very recalcitrant compounds or is it just very, very variable, we don't know enough yet? Uh, well, actually, that's what we say, a missing sink in the, in the global carbon cycle. I have to say that after this was published, we had a letter from an ecologist complaining about this being a missing thing. So anyway, you can read the letter and you can read our reply and it was actually very, very interesting. But yeah, that's, a, that's the idea and that's why we think it's important to incorporate it into models because imagine the boreal forest situation of 25% can apply to other ecosystems. Then 25% of the carbon we are saying that is being emitted is not emitted. And as you said, it's not only that it's not emitted, but once the vegetation recovers, because that carbon has a longer resident time, that's going to be what we call the missing carbon sink. 
Uh, we have uh, done similar in eucalypt forest. We are finding similar um, sim similar figures of around between 20 30 percent. Uh, there was a quite complete uh, study around the same time than this one in savanna. What savanna has a very com uh, high combustion efficiency because it is most of it is fine fuels that burn, and they found si uh, 16 percent. So I. My guess, and we are still working in the other ecosystem, my guess is this could be one of like an end ex example around 30% and savanna around 15%, 10%, the other example, or the other end. So we, it's, it's, it's quite significant. But I have to say that it's not only, of course, <laughs> The carbon that is remaining as pyrogenic carbon, some of it is, is going to be degraded in only a few months, other in a few years, other in a few um, centuries. So we are now looking into that. How much remains and how much of that is super recalcitrant, how much. So ideally, we will be able to include that in modeling, in global modeling at some point. I was going to say soon, but <laughs> let's say that at some point. The, the key thing there is also to add that we need to understand the pathways of this material because if it was a carbon sink, like you say, and we believe it is an actual fire, can be a carbon drawdown mechanism if you look at it in the long term, but we need to know where that stuff goes. We're clearly not drowning in it, so if we dig a, dig a, dig a soil pit, it's not full of pyrogenic carbon, although there's quite a lot in some places, mm. but the material is moving. So if you mm. look at this, there's quite a lot of dissolved pyrogenic carbon ending up in the oceans, and the question mm. is, how significant is this cycle and how long mm. have we got it right now? And also what happens in the future? If we had a steady state fire regime, <coughs> which we don't have, we might have you know, a steady state carbon sink or we might have just a complete steady state situation with the same amount emitted and this is sequestered. It seems like we do have a sink in the oceans. So it, it's quite likely that that sink exists, but what is gonna happen now when we have perhaps less area burned but much higher intensities, so in total much more fuel burned globally, even though the area is becoming mm. less, but the intensity is becoming more, is more emitted to the atmosphere of that fuel, mm. or do we have a higher ratio of pyrogenic carbon produced? There's a lot of unanswered questions in this, and we hope to be able to contribute mm. at least a little bit to this. But certainly we've been speaking to the modelers now for several years, and when we presented that first at the AGU in 2012, I think, it's like, yeah, right, bullshit. And now they're listening to us, and they, they are pretty much most of them are agreeing there's really something in it, our models aren't right, we need to update them. Hmm. So from that perspective it's been quite hmm. successful because we are not modelers, we are sort of field workers who hmm. yeah, spread and ash from the trees. <laughs> and I just wanted to say this is a, this field comes from a paper in Science uh, three years ago and it's very interesting, they, they look at dissolve, dissolve uh, black carbon, dissolve organic carbon in many rivers around the world and they found that this all, almost always around 15-20% of the total dissolved carbon, what is a lot. So yeah, that's, that's giving more strength to, to our hypothesis. But still many, many gaps. Yes, I'm going to say just a very obvious thing is for this budget you need to take into account the, uh, the, the fire return. It's of not course. the same as 16% in the in, in, in the Absolutely, and, yeah. We and, and then for, for the future modeling also, how this change with the, with the new context of climate change mm -hmm. and land use. Yeah. Because if it's 25% in the border for it, it's only burning, yeah, of course. it's not going to burn. So yeah, mm. yeah. I mean, it, this, it's, it's really interesting. This, this particular project in, in Canada was with collaborators uh, <coughs> from Natural Resources Canada, and including those who develop the CANFIRE model, so the model that accounts for Canadian emissions, they have already incorporated this. So we basically gone the first step, and of course they, they know exactly the fire return interval as it is now, but of course, as you say, that's even that is changing, and Canada is changing very rapidly in terms of uh, fire. I guess I have a, a very short question. Uh, it's nothing with that, but this is a curiosity, because probably you are closer to, to this point. When, when you show show us the, um, the post-fire replantation and how in Portugal and other places and how bad it was for soils because the Russia. Uh, do you think that that these practices are changing? Or they are they are keep in Portugal, in Spain anywhere to do the to doing these uh, aggressive uh, 
plantation of the farm. It's it certainly the the Portuguese work has been ongoing on has been going on for a long time. We still collaborate on this, and there certainly have been some changes in this. So what they have done in the past, for example, not quite on these steep slopes, but on some slopes, they basically did the contouring up and down the terrain, which is of course worst case scenario. <laughs> and after the first project, which is quite old now, it was in the 90s, they changed that practice unless they were on particular slopes that were too steep. Yeah, okay. So that's one thing. But what's also happening now is that after the fire they realize that um, they can certainly prevent some of the erosion by, by having specific rehabilitation um, approaches that don't involve this ridiculous deep plowing. But it's also a matter of money. If you have people mm -hmm. digging holes individually and planting the trees, that reduces the rev revenue. And I think after those extreme fires now in Portugal, we had a presentation about this yesterday, uh, a keynote on this. I think the overall policy um, of using eucalypts and also using these pine species at such high density, I think it's going to change because it's just a recipe for disaster. So yeah, yeah, I, I think things are going to improve. It's not going to improve economically because the forests there, they bring a lot of money, but they also bring death. So I think on that basis, things will change. They are, they are in shock. Yeah. Yeah, shock. Sometimes we need shock to make changes. Yeah. Well, it's yes. sad, but yeah. Okay, so thanks very much. Well, thank, yeah, you. thank you. Thank you.